Buonasera a tutti. Hello, everybody. I am pleased to moderate one of the sessions that is part of the event organized by the Prada Foundation, Culture and Consciousness. And the session is entitled Functional and Structural Neuroimaging. The session indeed is based also on the research results and approach of fundamental importance in basic and cognitive neuroscience, that is the imaging technique. In the last decades, we were testimonies of the development of sophisticated methods, and among those, electron microscopy, optogenetics, transcriptional profiling method, structural and functional magnetic resonance imaging. We have also to say in vivo molecular imaging with positron emission tomography, all together allowing such a comprehensive vision of the brain structure and function. For example, if we consider optogenetics, we can use light to turn on or off cells and neurons with remarkable accuracy and resolution in living and moving animals to control specific behaviors, but also to infer the contribution of individual cells to those behaviors. We can use a functional MRI to see brain activation during cognitive tasks and measure the strengths of the connection among activated neural systems to infer and better understand perception, cognition, and also the emergence of consciousness. We can analyze in vivo the neurochemical architecture of the brain by measuring the fundamental neurotransmitter systems, dopaminergic, adrenergic. Yesterday we heard by Pierre Changeau the importance of cholinergic system, all ensuring normal brain functioning, but also the emergence of altered behavior. This technique have revolutionized our knowledge about the function of the central nervous system, allowing us to measure and understand at the micro scale level molecular and cellular biochemical phenomena and their plastic modifications at the macro scale, macro scale level to see instead how the brain works, revealing the great complexity and integration of the neural systems underlying our sensory, motor, cognitive function and not least the organization of consciousness. Perhaps this evening you might be perplexed, in a sense, not to see many images of brain ignition with yellow blobs, red, or colored ba bundles of connective fiber tracts. But you must think that what you will hear tonight is the interpretation of these solid image-based results, which have contributed significantly to build equally solid stories and knowledge clever human interpretation and finalization. Thus, it's time and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce two very famous uh, neuroscientists, Eve Marder and Antonio Damasio. Here you can see them from direct. And I want to say that the contribution they gave to basic and coding neuroscience is enormous. Although starting from very different fields uh, and study approach, I think that their contribution to the knowledge of the brain function converts in demonstrating, on one hand, the role of the acquired and stable characteristic of the central nervous system, mandatory to its basic functionings, and on the other hand, the effect of the, for example, the environment, the life experience on the continuous plastic modification. Perception, cognition, and consciousness depend on the construction of the flexible and changing brain that can generate different behaviors and also different in one individual to another. We have to start. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Yves. Thank you, Antonio. And uh, I have to say that to the audience, please feel free to join our conversation by interacting with the speakers through the live chat. At the right of your screen, you can find the text box where you can write your questions or comment. We will be pleased to reply to those at the end of the two speeches. So first, it's my pleasure to introduce Eve Marder. She's a university professor of neuroscience at the Brandeis University. She is past president of the Society of Neuroscience, such an important society for all of us, a member of the National Academy of Science and Medicine and the American Academy of Science. She has received numerous awards for her pioneering work in the field, including the prestigious Gruber and Cavalier Awards, a Salpeter and Gerard Prize 
of the Society for Neuroscience, the Neuroscience Prize of the National Academy of Science. She also received several ad honorem doctorates from different universities. She is well known in the scientific community for her work on neural circuits in a small crustacean nervous system, which is made by few amount of neurons, up to 30. She discovered that circuits are not hardwired to produce a single output or a single behavior, but can be reconfigured by the so-called neuromodulators to produce many outputs and behavior while still maintaining the integrity of the circuit, homeostasis, crucial homeostasis. Computational and experimental studies in these small networks reveal that as a consequence of differences in neuron and network structures that are building up, individual animals are differentially resilient to environment challenges. So we have differences in this kind of response. This means that underlying brain structure and function are always changing. All humans are alike and all humans are different. I have to say that her work has revolutionized the way scientists approach the studies of neural circuits with respect to the study of structure and functional behaviors. So please, Eve, we are waiting to hear your talk, which title is Individual Difference and Differential Resilience. Thank you, Eve. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this. Although I must admit, um, being part of a, of a lecture series on consciousness is quite surprising for me since I don't really work on consciousness except uh, in my daily life. Um, and what I'm going to do, and as you just heard, I am unambiguously a basic neuroscientist and I work at the level of small circuits. So what I tried to do in putting together this talk was to find some of the lessons from our work that I think are definitely generally applicable to human brains and then to try and sort of show the paths um, for the importance of some of these ideas. Um, before starting, I would just like to um, thank um, why is this happening? Thank uh, all the people with whom I've worked over the years. And I would just like to say that everything I've ever done is um, benefits from the brilliance, creativity, and energy of all the people with who were in my lab and with whom I've collaborated. Now, um, yesterday you heard a little bit about different levels of organization in the brain. We have neurons, individual neurons, and they have their individual electrophysiological properties, that is to say, their activities. We have synapses, and those are the structures that connect neurons and make circuits. And I should say that synapses come in all different kinds of flavors and are quite different from each other. And the characteristics of those synapses are also very important. Then we have circuits, circuit modules, and um, cells are often put together into small circuit modules with characteristic properties. And one of the things that people like me do is study the properties of small circuits uh, that could be thought of as circuit modules in larger brains. Then you have large interacting circuits and then whole brain function. And there are some really puzzling questions that I think are really fundamental to understanding large brains. Um, and that is question one, is to what extent do the properties at each level of organization percolate to the next higher level of organization? So to phrase in another way, to what extent do the specifics or the details of how individual neurons work or how individual synapses work, to what extent do they shape the properties at the next level of organization? And then to what extent does the next level of organization um, and there are those interactions shape the properties of the final level of organization? And then another really important question that I'm sure you'll hear more about later, how does information travel in the brain? Um, so sometimes information may stay quite local 
to only one region of the brain. And you heard a little bit about this yesterday. And sometimes information travels throughout the brain and then what governs how it travels. And then the final piece of that is how does brain state change how information travels? And these are questions that we have studied in one way or another using small circuits, but that are obviously deeply relevant to understanding large brains, including human brains. Now, um, the first connectomes or wiring diagrams for small circuits came in the 1980s. And connectomes or wiring diagrams tell us the potential routes by which neurons and networks are connected. Basically, they ask or show us who talks to whom in the brain. Now, when we obtained the first sets of wiring diagrams, a lot of people were very disappointed because they thought that as soon as they had those wiring diagrams, it would be revealed or would be obvious how the brain actually, or how that circuit worked. And it was only after we had those first connectomes that we realized that the connectome or the wiring diagram was an absolutely necessary beginning first step to understand how to go from a wiring diagram to dynamics. And I think it's very, very important um, to remember the lessons we learned 40 years ago in small circuits as today the Brain Initiative and other initiatives around the world are setting out to have massive efforts to establish detailed connectomes for mouse and human brains. And these are completely essential for understanding how complex human brain dynamics arise, including consciousness, and how they emerge from biological processes and mechanisms. But again, the connectome the wiring diagram is completely essential and completely insufficient to really understand how dynamics come from the static picture that a connectome, um, especially one at the, at the EM level, the electron microscope level, um, and gives you a sense of what's going on. And I think the, the challenge is really to understand where the dynamics come from but you have to understand the dynamics in the context of the circuit or the connectome. Now, I'm gonna start going back a little bit to single neurons because first of all, I care deeply about them, but all of the neurons in your brain have certain properties. They're quite different from each other, but they have some very salient properties and whether you study them in a crab or a fly or in C. elegans or a mouse or a human. And some of them, or one of those properties, is sort of illustrated here. These are data coming from single cell um, PCR measurements. These are measurements that measure the messenger RNA levels for certain ion channels. In these experiments, individual neurons were dissected from, from a ganglion or a group of nerve cells in a crab. And then over 10 or 12 experiments, their data are shown here. And down here on the x-axis, you see the names of lots of different ion channels, genes. Now, I think we only have listed 20 or 22 of them, but I'm showing you this to make the point that every neuron we know about has many different kinds of ion channel genes. And one of the really interesting puzzles going forward is the kind of complexity that we see at the molecular level. How does this translate into differences at the electrophysiological level or in terms of the activity of those cells? And what role does this complexity play in understanding how circuits work and then how whole brains work? Now, I'd like to make one more point with this slide. You notice this dispersion in the values, these are single values, in our data and in everybody else's data, when you measure any parameter that you can reliably measure over and over again in multiple examples or multiple individuals, you see about a two to six fold range in those 
those uh, values. And what that tells you is that the parameters that are being used to both govern either the activity of single neurons or how they're connected synaptically varies in that range. And that's a very, very interesting range because it tells you what the degrees of freedom are for the, or the variability is that's consistent with normal appropriate biological um, activity. Now, um, we often build computational models to describe the behavior of neurons. I'm going to show you some of them. And this is a caricature of some of these models. And I'm just going to use them to remind you that um, neurons have many, as I said, many different kinds of ion channels. Only eight of them are shown here of the 22 or the 25 that many cells might have. But commonly, there's an inward sodium current that allows sodium to enter the cell. And that's important for the upswing or the depolarization of action potentials. There are multiple calcium channels. They also allow calcium to enter the cell, and that's very important for signaling. In our models, we include a current called IH. It's a hyperpolarization activated inward current. And I think Mavi even mentioned it yesterday, or she's worked on it. And then there are here, there are three different potassium channels. Um, there's a, and they differ from each other in terms of their voltage and time dependence. So the challenge is when we specify or measure the properties of a cell, of an individual cell, we measure the number of each one of these and other ion channels, and we measure the way in which the opening and closing of these channels depends on voltage and time. And when you put all that back together again, you get something that reflects the dynamics of the activity of the cell. Now, um, I just wanted to show you that to segue into one of the really fundamental principles um, that was alluded to before, and that is that the components of functional circuits are not static, but are constantly turning over rapidly during the lifetime of a neuron. Now, all of you are gonna live for 100 years, which means that almost all of your neurons are gonna live for 100 years. They were born early in development and they're gonna hang out in your nervous system, in your brain for all that time. Nonetheless, the receptors that are important for synaptic transmission and the ion channels that are important for signaling turn over in the membrane in either weeks or hours or days. And what that tells you is that the nervous system, all nervous systems, especially nervous systems of animals like, like humans who live a long time, have a challenge of, of asking how is function maintained while the nervous system is constantly rebuilding itself. And if you think about this, it tells you that the brain, and, and I'll say this probably several times, the brain has the challenge of <coughs> replacing every single component that's important for neuronal signaling while it's working. And no engineer would want to ever have to repair anything that was broken while it was, in, while it was working. Nobody would want to repair a 747 while it was in flight. But that is exactly what the brain is doing. And so there have to be these very beautiful and important mechanisms that allow the nervous system to constantly rebuild itself. Now, we and many other people have studied homeostatic models and mechanisms. In the models I'll show you in a second, we say that neurons self-tune their conductances, that is to say the number of their ion channels, to maintain a target activity pattern. And these models stipulate that it's the neuron's activity that is controlled, not the number of each type of ion channel. And this is very important because it tells you that every neuron probably has mechanisms that allow it to monitor its own activity and then to use that in a feedback mechanism to recreate itself. Now, when it recreates itself, it doesn't recreate itself identically, constantly, but it's 
wandering around within a desired set of activity patterns. Now, I'm gonna show you just one, one slide showing that these mechanisms can be in operation. This is an example of what we call a bursting neuron. It's depolarizing, it's firing several here, three action potentials, and then it's stopping and then firing another set of action potentials. And this is a desired pattern of activity in many cases. And then we depolarized it. That's knocking it out of its desired state. And then slowly over time, the neuron is rebuilding itself back to its activity state. And the way we, way we think this works is that neurons monitor their own activity using a monitor like an intracellular calcium concentration. They have a target activity. And in response to being away from the target, they actually cause the insertion or deletion of ion channels in the membrane to bring themselves back to this target of activity. Now notice this activity that recovers is similar to the starting activity, although the depolarization perturbation is still present. So this is a homeostatic response that allows the cell to maintain its activity despite the perturbation. Now these same roles can become important in understanding development or can self-assemble. So this is an old slide here. You have two model neurons. They're both silent. And then as they sense the fact that they're not at their target activity, they build themselves into, again, being bursters. And these are just the values that they started out. And then over time, each of the conductances changes and this is in model one, model two. Notice they all change, but that every single conductance is changing, but the activity now has reached a preferred target level. So this shows that you can self-assemble um, from inactivity to target activity level. Now, so just to say what I already said, brains are not stationary, but are constantly rebuilding themselves replacing every component continuously. Now this raises the conundrum. How does brain function, memory, and for this meeting, sense of self persist when all components are in a constant state of flux? And I think this is one of the deepest problems in, um, in neuroscience to really understand the rules by which this replacement is done and then how you have stability of function despite the necessity to replace all components. Now, I'm gonna move from single neurons to small circuits um, and, and to show you another um, set of observations. And, and this goes to the question of individual variability. So Astrid Prince was a postdoc and she wanted to build a model of a three cell circuit that would be similar to one of the circuits that we study. And what she did is she chose um, five or six cells of each cell type, five or six values for each synaptic connection. Now this is the connectome. And then she simulated all sorts of values and she simulated 20 million model networks. And then she selected the ones that had her preferred activity. And of them, she found 2.4% of them that had a preferred activity pattern that matched the activity pattern in biological recordings. Now, but that wasn't what I really wanted to show you. This is what I wanted to show you. Here are two model networks and they're producing very similar behavior. Both of these would be normal behavior. If they were humans and the person was walking um, you would say they're both walking normally. And now when we look at the underlying parameters that went into building model network one and model network two, you realize that the underlying parameters are completely different. So this particular parameter, which is the H current in one of the neurons is big here, it's small here. 
the synapse from PY to LP is big here, small here. And you can see this set of parameters and this set of parameters are totally different, but the, the behavior of the circuit is almost identical. So when you look at this, you say two things. This tells you that, oh my, you could say, now I understand why it could be you could have two cats or two humans walking down the street with a tremendous amount of underlying variability in the underlying values of the parameters that give rise to their brain behavior, but they can have very similar behavior. But this also raises another question and that says, or immediately says, that this set of parameters and this set of parameters would likely cause this animal or this animal to respond very differently to perturbations. And they might have very different resilience to stress. And that I think is the other really big piece of this, which is exactly um, that answer. So when we got those, um, those data, we wanted to ask how variable the parameters in real biological networks. I already showed you the, the answer to that. It's about two to six fold in every parameter that we've measured. And then the question is, do perturbations reveal cryptic animal to animal differences? So for example, in terms of humans, are there cryptic human to human differences that only become revealed under stress? or under environmental perturbations. And then the question is obviously how reliably can animals with intrinsic variability respond to perturbations? And then, and this is a question we have no idea, but is one that is really crucial to understanding humans are some sets of parameters associated with higher resilience. You know, what determines why some people are exposed to COVID and get sick and others are exposed to COVID and don't get sick, et cetera. Now, to answer this question about resilience in response to stress, we wanted to look at a stress that the animals we work on would normally see, which is temperature. They live in the ocean. They see temperatures from about two degrees centigrade to about 25 degrees centigrade. And so now we're looking at recordings of that rhythm. This is the connectome or the wiring diagram. And now you're seeing intracellular recordings of the membrane potential of each of the three neurons at 7, 11, 15, 19, 23 degrees. The patterns is the same, but the frequency is changing. And that's what you'd expect. And you can see the patterns very, very well maintained. And that's true for the temperatures that these animals usually see. All animals, even though they have that two to six fold variability in their underlying structures, they all respond in this temperature range completely normally. So you would never know that those differences were there. But if you stress them further, if you go from 23 degrees to high temperature, 31 degrees, you start seeing crashes or loss of activity. And this is just recovery. But more interesting than that, if you look at temperatures between complete crash and normal activity, and these are now recordings for four different animals, four different people, if you will, notice that the patterns that you get are completely different. And so our interpretation of this is that the stress is revealing the effects of those underlying or cryptic differences in parameters that you don't see until you really stress the system. So to summarize that, at low temperatures, all networks are well behaved, showing consistent changes in frequency and outstanding temperature compensation. But, and this is really important as we come thinking about humans, each individual animal crashes with individual dynamics as predicted by their underlying parameter differences. Now, obviously there can be classes of crashes that multiple animals show, but fundamentally you would expect if each human is different at the, at, if you then 
had a good enough assay for their behavior, you would see that they all under extreme perturbation showed different kinds of um, crashes, if you will. Okay, so this just says what I just showed you. Um, individuals with similar starting circuit performance um, with very similar circuit mechanisms in the control can nonetheless show entirely different crash mechanisms. And this is really a cautionary tale for thinking about disease because depending on what those starting states are, you might expect that pharmacology or other therapeutics might be differently useful depending on the underlying mechanisms of those crashes. This is probably why it's so difficult to get good therapeutics for things like epilepsy and depression and schizophrenia. Okay, so differential resilience in the population, just to repeat, is a necessary feature that comes from the inherent degeneracy of multiple solutions. And I think it's really important um, to remember that and then some mechanisms for differential resilience are automatic, and then some mechanisms for resilience will depend on homeostatic mechanisms, behavioral adaptation and learning. Now, I wanna show you one additional set of, um, of points that have to deal with what I call parallel pathways and neuromodulation and connectomes. And to do that, I'm gonna show you now a more complicated set of recordings. These look a lot like some of the recordings you saw yesterday from complex brains. These are recordings that come from a crab, but nonetheless show fairly complex dynamics. In particular, there's a fast rhythm that's seen up here and a slow rhythm that's seen down here. But what's most interesting is there are neurons in here that are firing as part of the fast rhythm but are also firing in an envelope of activity in time with a slow rhythm. So these are neurons that are part of two different circuits and they actually can flip back and forth between part of the different circuits. And I'm just showing you these data just to make the point that one of the things that brains do is that neurons can get combined into different ensembles under different circumstances, either experience or neuromodulation or a variety of other things. Okay, now, this is the full connectome of the ganglion we study. And you can see it has, it's complicated. Now, there are only 26 cells in this crab ganglion, um, and it's already fairly complicated. And if I asked you to predict what this connectome would do, you'd be unable to know. Now, in these nomenclatures, this resistor symbol means electrical coupling. Those are electrical synapses. And all these filled circles are chemical inhibitory synapses. And we haven't talked much about inhibition, but in this network, all of the timing comes from inhibition. But the important thing is, the reason I'm showing you this connectome is to show you that at the core of this connectome is what I call parallel pathways. So here there's there's a little circuit module called reciprocal inhibition. We sometimes call that a half center oscillator. These two neurons fire in alternation out of phase with each other. When one is on, the other one is off and vice versa. But notice that this neuron inhibits this IC neuron monosynaptically. It makes a direct connection, but it also can inhibit this neuron LP and then through this electrical junction, inhibit this indirectly. So this is what I call a parallel pathway. There are two ways for information to travel between neuron one and neuron two, either directly or indirectly. And likewise, inner neuron one makes a monosynaptic connection to IC and also a polysynaptic connection, again, through this reciprocal inhibitory pathway over here. So, in this five cell circuit, you already see parallel pathways. And parallel pathways are a part of all brain regions. And they complicate understanding how information travels because you'd wanna know 
how much information is traveling through this part of the pathway, how much is coming through this way, and to what extent does that change what the circuit will do. Now to address this, I'm going to show you a model that Gabrielle Guder has built, and she decided to build a model of this, of this circuit. And so we have a fast oscillator here, a slow oscillator here, and a hub neuron. So each neuron is now modeled as an oscillator, two fast neurons, a medium or a hub neuron, and two slow oscillators. When she creates this reciprocal inhibition, F1 and F2 fire in alternation, as I said, so to S1 and S2. And then when she couples them all up, you see that. Okay, now this is what the whole five cell circuit does. And I'm gonna spend a tiny bit of time showing you how she's chosen to visualize what the network does. So one of the challenges that we have, whether we talk about small circuits or large circuits or human brains, is finding a way of visualizing the activity so that our human brain can understand what's going on. So the visualization tool that Gabrielle created was a series of circles and squares where F1 is the outside circle, F2 is the second one. The box here is HN, this is the frequencies of each of these cells, S2 and S1. So this whole image tells you the frequency of every neuron in the circuit. And now she's called the, the strength of this synapse is G sin A, that's the conductance or the strength of the synapse. And that's true here. And the strength of the electrical synapse is GL. So one set of parameters gives you this set. So here the hub neuron is firing slowly and the two fast neurons are firing an alternation. The two slow neurons are firing an alternation, but here they're slow and the hub neuron is firing with the slow. And in this different set of parameters, all five neurons are firing at the same frequency. This allows you to see it immediately, what's going on. And now, if you now do as modelers like to do, or as people trying to understand the role of a parameter in the behavior of anything like to do, we have a plot on the X of the conductance of G sin A, that's the chemical synapse, and the conductance of the electrical synapse. And now you have a map of the activity of the brain. So this whole region here has one of the neurons firing fast and four of them firing slowly. This whole region has four of them firing pretty fast and one of them fires slowly. And then this region here is all five of them firing at the same frequency. And you can see the boundaries as you go through these qualitative changes in brain activity. And this kind of qualitative, qualitative change in brain state is at the core of understanding how humans brain, human brains do a lot of things because understanding what sets the state of the brain, whether this circuit is producing this kind of behavior or this kind of behavior is at the core of trying to understand um, why brains are doing what they're doing when they're doing it. Now, to show you a couple more slides about this, if we come in with a neuromodulator, something which increases the strength of this synapse, if you start over here in this brain state, it will take you across two different state transitions and take you from this activity pattern to this activity pattern. So, that's very profound. On the other hand, if you were to start here in a different state and now put in much more modulator, which produces a much bigger change in the strength of that parameter, however, you're not changing qualitatively the behavior of that, of that circuit. Instead, you're maintaining that activity, even though you've got much more modulator um, present. And this is really a very beautiful way of seeing what we call state dependent <coughs> brain activity. And that is to say the action of this modulator will have very different effects 
depending on the starting state of the network. And here you'll have no qualitative change. Here you'll have a very strong qualitative change, even though at the, at the much less um, action is produced here than here. Now I just have two more slides to show you from this work, which make go back to this issue of parallel pathways. So here we have that starting five cell circuit and notice this HN neuron is firing slowly in time with the slow neurons. And then here we change the strength of this synapse and now the slow neuron, the hub neuron is firing with the fast network. And then you do a different perturbation. You change the strength of this synapse, the electrical synapse, and you can move the hub neuron from slow to fast. And then you do a still a different perturbation and you can produce the same change in behavior. So the answer here is this is only a five cell circuit, but imagine it's five parts of the brain. There are three entirely different mechanisms to give rise to what looks like the same change in, in neuronal coordination. And this is very, very, very important. It arises precisely because these parallel pathways, which are all over the brain, but it means that there's no single mechanism by which you can control what this neuron is doing. Rather, there are three, and there are three entirely different mechanisms that can produce changes in behavior that look very much the same. And this is very, very, very important, and it almost certainly is taking place in our brains. Not exactly like this, but in similarly. Now, I'd just like to end with this last slide which goes back to this issue of, that was raised yesterday that I think um, Jean-Pierre actually re raised yesterday. And that is the whether neuromodulation stays local or changes the activity of a whole circuit or a whole brain. So what Gabrielle has done here is she's modulated the properties of this HN neuron. You can see here the waveforms are changed. And if she takes those, different HN neurons and puts them in starting set of parameters here, then as she changes the behavior of this hub neuron, the circuit is basically unchanged. The neuron that she's changing or modulating is changed, but everybody else stays the same. However, if she starts with a different brain state, a different set of parameters, and now she changes the behavior of this central neuron, it entirely changes the behavior of the entire circuit. So here, the center neuron has gone silent. And you can see, if you just look at these color facts, they're entirely different. So in this case, modulation of only one neuron has percolated through and influenced the behavior of the entire network. In this case, modulation of one neuron has stayed local. And this becomes a very, very important concept for thinking about local versus global effects of neuromodulation in large brains. So to go back to the very beginning, we have levels of organization, we have neurons, synapses, circuit modules, large interacting circuits, whole brain circuits. And the question, the really deep question, we have to constantly ask, to what extent do the properties at each level of organization percolate to the next higher level of organization? And then to me, one of the deep unanswered questions is, in other words, are circuits formed from highly resilient neurons more resilient than those formed from less resilient neurons? Or does resiliency at each level of organization arise by rules or interactions at that level? And we know that all individual brains are different and differently resilient to challenge. How different are their connectomes and how does this influence their function and how information travels? And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation that I hope and I think everybody enjoyed. And now it's time to move to uh, present uh, the second speaker, which is uh, uh, very famous uh, 
neuroscientist Antonio Damasio. He's a Portuguese American neurologist and neuroscientist. He was born in Lisbon. He was the chair of neurology at the University of Iowa for 20 years. And I remember very well all his works and papers who came out at that time that highlight my research and uh, I follow a lot. He is currently the David Dom's Life Chair of Neuroscience, as well as a professor of psychology, philosophy, neurology at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, and an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute, La Jolla. He heads the Brain and Creativity Institute. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, the National Academy of Medicine, the European Academy of Science and Arts. He's a recipient of several prizes, among them the Grave Mayer Award, the Prince of Asturias Award in Science and Technology, the Beaumont Medal for the Academy Medical Association, as well as an honorary degree from the Sorbonne, shared with his wife, Anna Damasio, which is also a very famous neuroscientist. He also received several doctorates from several universities. His main research fields are behavioral neurology, neurobiology, system and cognitive neuroscience, especially addressing the neural system which underlies emotion, decision-making, memory, language, and consciousness. As a clinician, he studied and treated disorders of behavior and cognition and movement disorders. He's authored hundreds of scientific papers and several books. We know that he was named by the Institute of Scientific Information as one of the, as the, one of the most cited researchers in the past decade and he's listed as one of the 50 key thinkers in the human science in the past two centuries. I really believe that. I would like just to uh, mention some of his very influential books. You students, doctoral students, postdoc, you have to consider it for your knowledge and, uh, and thinking. The Cart Error, Emotion, Reason and the Human Brain, which won several prizes. The feeling of what happens, body and emotion, in the making of consciousness, which has over 30 foreign editions. Looking for Spinoza, joy, sorrow, and the feeling brain, where Damasio suggests that Spinoza was a protobiologist in his view on the mind-body problem. And finally, his last book, Self Comes to Mind, Constructing the Conscious Brain where he illustrates the key conscious minds, and we heard about tonight in his talk. I want to remember that he says, he writes in the belief that scientific knowledge can be a pillar to help humans endure and prevail. Please, Antonio, I'm happy to see you here, <laughs> even at distance. And uh, the title of the talk is On the Biology of Feeling and Consciousness. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. It's a pleasure to join you today. Um, and uh, let me say, buonasera a tutti e buona salute, which is most important at this point. Um, so, what, thank you very much for your, for your very kind introduction. Uh, it's quite interesting the way this meeting was put together because we have just uh, we're just going from one level of the sublime in biology uh, which is the connectome that Eve Marder uh, studies so deeply uh, to another level of sublime which is at the polar end it's what results from all this uh, great organization uh, and that includes of course the human mind uh, and it includes phenomena such as feeling and consciousness that I want to touch on. Uh, let me just warn you that these are very brief lectures. What I'm going to talk about is something that I normally would discuss in detail with uh, images and slides uh, for probably at least two lectures, if not three, uh, and that's in summary form. So we're going to have to be brief and hit the main points. Um, let me begin by saying that these two uh, concepts, the concept of feeling and the concept of consciousness, are normally presented as very distant from each other. Um, 
most people automatically relate to what feeling uh, is and have a sense of it, uh, even without uh, any kind of scientific background. Um, people also have a sense of what consciousness may be, but it's a very different level. Uh, and the two things normally don't tend to go together. And I'm here to tell you that they do, and that physiologically, you cannot understand one without the other. Um, so th th this is my first, my first point. Um, the second point is that both uh, feeling and consciousness are related to something deeper, something that is in fact behind a lot of this morning's conversation already, and that is the process of life and the process of life regulation, namely homeostasis. Uh, we were hearing from uh, Eve uh, how at the neuron level, uh, we have to constantly adjust parameters so that the life of that neuron can continue and how a very complex machinery, uh, including ion channels and genes that control ion channels are uh, arranging for that environment to be maintained within certain parameters that are compatible with the continuation of the neuron activity and the continuation of the life of that neuron. Well, the same thing happens at the very large scale of a, a human creature. And I'm not just talking about the human brain, but the human person in a human body. Uh, we need to constantly adjust parameters uh, in the life of that organism. And uh, at our high end, we can think of parameters that are of much larger scale. Uh, for example, temperature, uh, the, the level of oxygen, the level of glucose, um, and many other uh, chemical and physical parameters that if not maintained within certain ranges, are going to lead to disease and to death. Um, and in fact, feeling and consciousness are very much to, uh, related to the control of homeostasis. I should actually say that they are key components of homeostatic regulation in complex creatures. They are not going to be uh, very important at the level of C. elegans, but they are very important at the level of multicellular uh, highly complex multi-system uh, uh, individuals such as we are, not just humans, but many other uh, species. And uh, before I go any further in telling you about uh, feeling and consciousness and how I interrelate them, uh, let me make a parenthesis to say that when we think about consciousness and about feeling uh, and about mind, um, we very often make the mistake of assuming that all living creatures uh, will also have such phenomena and will also have nervous systems uh, as we do and will depend on those um, processes such as, for example, feeling and consciousness in order to organize their homeostasis. And uh, I, the first thing I want to say is that this is just not the case. In fact, when you look at the majority of living creatures on the face of the earth and at the oldest living creatures on the face of the earth in terms of, the, in terms of evolution, what we find is very simple creatures such as bacteria, you know, prokaryotes, they don't even have a nucleus. Uh, and many creatures that do have a nucleus and have a unicellular. And yet those individuals uh, go through life quite intelligently uh, with a lot of smarts. Uh, they regulate their life. They're able to sense, the pre detect the presence of other organisms. They're able to detect the presence of certain conditions in the, their environment and respond to them adequately. And yet those creatures have non-explicit competencies that don't depend on a mind, that don't depend on consciousness, and that don't depend on a nervous system. Uh, so it's very important that we realize that four billion years ago, uh, we had creatures that were beginning to operate like this. They have complicated physiological arrangements, uh, even if they have only one cell, for example, 
uh, but yet they are already possessed of life. They have a birth date and a death point. Uh, their life is regulated over a, a period of time uh, and is maintained within homeostatic parameters. And in fact, they can even be organized socially and respond socially to the kind of environment that they're dealing with. For example, if the environment is highly conducive to uh, provides nutrients, uh, they can separate themselves and, and, and live more or less as individuals. But if the environment is not conducive and is threatening in some way, uh, those creatures actually do the opposite. They aggregate and they, they band together like we do when we are being attacked. Uh, and we need to fend off and create force in the defense. Uh, so uh, even if uh, it is beautiful to talk about nervous systems, which is what I do for a living or even martyr, uh, and it is beautiful to talk about these incredibly beautiful complex functions uh, in operations such as feeling and consciousness and the existence of minds. Um, that we need to realize that the majority of creatures on earth, creatures that are in fact part of our microbiome and that are included in our own organisms and contribute beautifully to our own organisms, that, those, that, that all those creatures do not have the reliance on the nervous system, do not have these complex functions that we are talking about uh, today and yet they are alive and well and counting. Uh, they're the most numerous. And so it just puts us in awe, not just of the nervous system, not just of these very complex functions that depend on the nervous system, but also in awe of the phenomena of life itself and what it can produce. And let me just add what it can anticipate because in the end, at the large scale, view, uh, I believe that what we have in mind and in feeling uh, as part of mind and in consciousness are in fact projections of this enormous regulatory capacity that has uh, it, it existed throughout life, even without nervous systems. And that of course, in the you know recent 500 million years, uh, that we have had nervous systems in organisms in the 100 million years or 200 at the most in which we have had things that resemble our minds uh, and consciousness um, uh, have existed. So uh, it, it's, it's a sense that we need to have of modesty, not only in relation to the, the monstrous task of understanding uh, brains at the small scale or large scale, but also the task of understanding how this fits into the great project and reality of life. Okay, so um, let me move on to uh, feelings uh, and, and, and consciousness itself. Uh, so the first thing I was wanted to tell you is that the two are related. The two are related through the process of homeostasis and that uh, it is not conceivable to me, although this is not uh, necessarily the case for everybody, that either feelings or consciousness can exist without nervous systems. So what we were hearing about from uh, Eve is extremely important to give us an idea of the enormous complexity that we have in nervous systems, even when we're thinking about very, very small creatures with very small connectomes with just a small group of neurons. And yet the complexity is huge and no one can, can decipher it completely. Now we have to uh, think that creatures th that do not have such nervous systems, even the very simple ones, are even less likely to be able to have phenomena as complex as minds and consciousness. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm reluctant to admit that any creature that would not have a nervous system uh, would be able to have minds is because what we talk about when we talk about minds is the capacity to manipulate uh, uh, literally a cortege of representations, a cortege of what mounts in my 
parlance to images. And what is that? It requires an ability to take something either in the outside world or inside our own organisms and create a map of that thing. And in order to create a map of that thing, uh, we cannot do it without neurons, not only just neurons, but neurons arranged in circuits. And in many cases, as we have so clearly, uh, as clearly has been demonstrated through the study, for example, of say the visual cortex or the auditory cortex, we need to have uh, uh, neurons that are distributed in very particular patterns that are compatible with the making of a map, literally making a sketch of something you hear or something that you see or something that you touch uh, or something that your nervous system is quote unquote looking at and seeing inside your organism because there too you have the possibility of creating images of your interior by mapping the structures of your interior which happen to be the viscera that we have you know our hearts lungs uh, our blood circulation, our skin and the guts and, and so forth. So the, the, the idea that uh, we are not likely to generate uh, uh, minds and all of its perturbations without having nervous systems, I think is an idea that can be defended uh, and, and uh, be, I can say the following, if it is not likely that creatures with the complexities that Eve showed this morning, if it's not likely that they have minds or consciousness, uh, it's even less likely that creatures that do not have nervous systems at all, such as eukaryotes, uh, would uh, be able to create such uh, complex uh, operations. So uh, let, let me uh, start with what I really want to talk about, a little bit about the core physiology of feelings, what feelings are. Now, uh, people, uh, unlike with the term consciousness that creates all sorts of confusions, uh, everybody thinks that they know what feelings are. Uh, they don't, but that's okay. Uh, most of the time, people actually confuse feeling uh, with, with the emotion, which is a grave uh, um, problem and a grave error, and which I would like to ask all of you in the audience, not to ever make. In other words, feelings are phenomena that are occurring in our minds. They are the ultimate subjective phenomena, uh, and they are internal, they are mental, and they are in fact, to begin with, mental expressions of the state of our own organisms. So when you declare yourself feeling well, what you are describing is a state of mind in which you sense the operations of your body physiology, the operations of your organism as being in a certain degree of harmony without any sort of stress uh, flowing easily with the amount of energy that you have at that moment, uh, without any complaints of being too hot or too cool uh, or too trembling or too whatever you are feeling well. By the same time, we also know, uh, especially at a time in which you're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you also know what it is to feel sick. You feel sick when a lot of these parameters of life, organization and flow are suddenly put under stress and they are uh, um, alerting us to the fact that we are no longer compatible with the continuation of life and that things are really going awry in a very, very fast way. By the way, you can even have very, very punctate, very specific uh, points at which the physiology really goes uh, down and you can talk about pain, having pain localized, for example, in an organ. You can have a heart attack and have huge pain that you refer to your chest or you can break a bone and have huge pain that is related to everything that went wrong with the physiology at that point. At the same time, you can mention well-being, but you can also have other subjective states, uh, such as the state of happiness, uh, or the state of fear, or a state of sadness. 
And there, you're dealing with something that is not just about the homeostasis uh, of your organism. You're dealing with something that has been superposed on that homeostasis, either for the good or for the bad. And that is really the result of an emotion. So uh, to uh, leave you with immediately on the notion of feeling with something tangible and useful for today, let's agree that feelings are about ideas, about mind, about mental expressions of the state of the organism, that feelings really come in two varieties. The variety that I call homeostatic, homeostatic feelings, such as well-being, sickness, pain, um, and so forth. Or in the emotional variety, you have feelings such as sadness, fear, happiness, uh, anger, and so, and, and so forth. And those homeostatic feelings are still mental expressions, of course, but they are mental expressions of the state of your organism after it has been challenged by a particular problem in the environment or a particular problem that you have in your own mind. In that, for example, you may be threatened, you may, your life may be at risk, and you, are, you have a reaction which is posed to organize the first response, the sort of a, the, the first alarm, the SOS of your organism in relation to the threat, and that uh, arranges your organism in the state that we call fear. And lots of things change in your organism in terms of what your heart does, in terms of your blood pressure, in terms of your breathing, in terms of the uh, metabolism that is prepared all of a sudden to cope with an emergency which may involve you running away from where you are to somewhere else. So whether we have homeostatic feelings or you have feelings that are emotional, in both cases, you're dealing with something that is mental, something that is in your mind uh, and that expresses a variety of arrangements that are physiological and that are in of themselves collections of actions. So when you are in fear, you do th such things as recoil uh, from where you are. Uh, you have all the changes that are occurring inside your organism. Your face mask changes, uh, your, uh, the position of your limbs and so forth. All of those are the result of actions that are being taken um, very smartly by our organisms under the control of the nervous system to allow us to cope with our life, to make sure ahead of time that we're not going to drift in a situation that will lead us to sickness and death. Um, and likewise, you have the other, so, but all of this are the, the feelings are the feelings of the actions and of the result of the actions. And the feelings may be the very simple ones that are just the result of the plain operations of our organism uh, under no particular stress or under no particular uh, state of uh, happiness and felicity. Uh, and, and that simply uh, it expresses the, the day to day movement of our metabolism, of our um, handling of the, the multiple challenges that are occurring in a multi system uh, complex organism uh, such as ours. So, the distinction between emotions and feelings should be done, and the fact that the, the, the feelings are a different thing should be clear also. Now, I want to uh, tell you a couple of things more that are important here. Why, you should ask yourself, why is it that feelings are so important? So they are clearly the informers, they're giving us this direct information about the state of our organism. Uh, and why is that important? Well, that's important because once you know that something is happening of a particular kind, you may take actions that are corrective and that may in fact save your life. So this capacity to inform, this capacity to give you a classification 
and perspective on the state of your organism is something extremely valuable for homeostasis, therefore extremely valuable for your survival, therefore indispensable. But just think of this because it's very often uh, sort of overlooked and brushed aside in discussions of feelings. The value of it comes from the fact that all of this is in consciousness. This is not just in your mind, but it is in your mind in a peculiar way that is telling you without you asking any question, wait, this has to do with me, with you, this has to do with this organism, this has to do with myself in that organism. So uh, one thing that I, I do want you to remember from this talk, and you may agree or disagree, it doesn't make any difference, uh, is that the, the merit of feelings is the merit of consciousness, is the fact that they inform what they inform and that they are valuable to us because they are in us consciously. And to be in consciousness, contrary to what very often one is led to believe, which is something very mysterious, impossible to describe or describable in so many different ways, that is a, a, a uh, buzzing confusion, the, the merit of consciousness is to refer what's in your mind to yourself. In other words, is to declare directly that you own your mind, you're the owner, you're the controller, and all of that is what gives rise to what in psychology and in philosophy, one talks about as the I, as the self, but all of that is in fact reducible to the ownership of the mind, which lo and behold is also the ownership of the body in which that mind is occurring thanks to the interactions between the body and the nervous system. So. One thing that I'm telling you is that the solution to the problem of consciousness passes through the solution to the problem of feeling because in fact, consciousness begins with feeling. And that is the reason that it can only occur in creatures that are endowed with nervous systems and very complex ones capable of making minds and capable of making maps and images and what consciousness is in the end is a state of mind in which the ownership of the organism is obvious the ownership of the mind is obvious as well so uh, that's the first important point now what we what i would also like to touch although not in, in, in the full extent is how is this actually possible? How is it that we can make such things as maps of our uh, organism and end up with something that is our mind and a particular kind of mind, which is a, 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 an interactive image of our organism that gives us feeling. And here I would like to call your attention to the physiology that is behind feeling because that physiology that is behind feeling is always also to a great extent, the physiology that is going to be behind consciousness because you cannot have one without the other. And that, uh, for this, I need to refer to the ways in which we collect information in our brains, in our organisms as a whole, about the world inside of us and the world outside. The physiology of the outside is actually, and quite understandably, the one that was elucidated first. We have had now, uh, thanks to the work of uh, people such as David Ewell and Torsten Wiesel, uh, and many of those that followed uh, in that particular line of studies, we have known how, for example, the visual system operates to make those maps that I mentioned 
and those uh, image generate the basis for those images that I mentioned. And they are the images that we call vision. And of course, parallel uh, investigations have now been done in relation to hearing, in relation to tactile uh, processes and so forth. Um, what is interesting about all of those is that this extraceptive um, functionality uh, is based on the fact that we have sensory organs, for example, our eyes, our retinas, that allow us to make maps in of themselves, in those sensory organs of the outside world. So for example, I, I look to the right, I'm looking now, I'm at home, and I'm looking at the Santa Monica mountains and the beautiful sky because it's only 11 o'clock, 11.15 in the morning, not night like for you. Uh, and they are there and I'm here and the maps that I'm making are maps that uh, rely on the, the construction of this pattern, the construction of those images. But the pattern and the images and the reality that is outside are entirely in separate uh, worlds. The, the, the reality is out there and around me and my organism and my nervous system are in me. Now, one, when I describe that I am sick or that I am happy or that I have pain, let's take pain, uh, what I am describing is something that comes through what is known as interoception, and far less is known about interoception than about extraception, for reasons that are quite obvious. Why study with the complicated and inside when you can look outside first, and that's more patent and, and obvious. Uh, and interoception is relying on pretty much the same structure. You have a nervous system that is embedded everywhere in the organism, and that has probes, and those probes are, in fact, uh, the uh, nerve terminals that are all over our organism. And through those nerve terminals that are everywhere, we are everywhere in our body. We're bringing into the nervous system, into the central nervous system, for example, through the avenue of spinal ganglia or the, the brainstem nuclei, we're bringing that information into the spinal cord and the brainstem and eventually up uh, into the, the cerebral cortex in particular regions, such as the insular region or the cingulate, which collect at cortical level information from everything that came into the body. Now, first thing I want to call your attention is this, and this is something that you probably have not heard because everybody ignores it, is that the relationship between the body and the nervous system is completely different from the relation that we in the nervous system have with the, the world around. The world around can come, for example, directly into my retinas uh, and be mapped. Uh, and there's nothing I can do about the world. I cannot force, when I look at the landscape outside, I cannot force and change the landscape at will. Um, I, I can imagine it differently, but that's a different story. In relation to our inner world, though, the, the, the relation is completely different. The nervous system is, in fact, located inside my organism. It's something that came very late in the history of organisms. There is a part of our organism only, and yet it's mapping all around this organism. But it so happens that the nervous system has the possibility of replying to every nook and cranny that connects to the central nervous system and therefore modulate and change what is actually being perceived. So the reason why I think pain is a good example is that suppose right now you have a wound and you have that wound and you have acute pain from that wound. Even before anybody gives you a treatment for that, surgical or medication or a painkiller, your own nervous system is going to dampen the pain and is going to modify the perception you have of your own organism. Why? Well, because it can. Because it is so interactive and so interconnected that it can, through the avenue of chemical mediation, 
can modify the physics of the locality where the pain is in fact arising, where the pain is coming from. So th this is dramatically different. And if, uh, if anybody wants to explain to you feeling using exactly the same line of thought that you have to explain vision or hearing, you should disabuse people of that idea and sh should say, no, the circumstances are completely different. We don't handle information from inside our bodies the same way that we handle information from outside of our bodies. That's the first thing. The second is something that goes in the direction of Eve's talk, is to look at the kinds of neurons that are actually committed to this job of interocepting and of giving us information about what's in our bodies. And there, uh, there are incredibly uh, strange circumstances that are quite atypical uh, in relation to, to, to the, uh, uh, the, the function of other neurons. The first thing is that uh, the, major the vast majority of those neurons do not have myelin. And when you don't have myelin, you're lacking an insulator and you're exposing uh, the axons of the neurons to the influences of the surround, the chemical surround, uh, in a way that does not happen when you have a, a, a neuron that has an axon that is fully myelinated. Quite clearly, a lot of our extraception depends on uh, um, highly evolved, uh, heavy, heavily myelinated neurons, and practically all of our interoception depends on much older uh, phylogenetically neurons that in fact do not have that myelination. Another thing that happens is that throughout the organization, for example, when you look at spinal ganglia, uh, the, 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 the places where you have a bunch of cell bodies of neurons and, and then you, you disperse axons in relation in the direction of the body and in the direction of the nervous system. It so happens that they do not have a blood-brain barrier. Um, so what happens is that this, this uh, uh, arrangement that we have to protect our nervous system, our central nervous system in particular, from the influences of the chemical surround uh, are lacking at the level of the spinal ganglia. So things that are circulating in our bloodstream can have a direct action on those spinal ganglia. And by the way, everything that comes into your head, uh, in, or everything that goes from your head into the nervous system uh, through and that uh, utilizes, for example, the trigeminal uh, ganglia uh, is also lacking in blood-brain barrier. So we have, uh, I, I wanted to call your attention to the fact that we have this great asymmetry in the ways in which the the, the, the background physiology of feeling is organized uh, and that we have something that we have to first not consider a mere perception. Feelings are not mere perceptions of the state of our body, either locally like in pain uh, or in general like in well-being or, or pleasure. Um, and it's rather than a mere plain perception like we have of the outside world, it's something different. It's something that comes from an interaction between the nervous system and the body in general, the non-neural component of the body, which, by the way, as I tried to point out when I referred to, uh, when, when I refer to the non-minded, uh, non-neural creatures, is something with a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge and a lot of mechanisms of uh, regulation because we know that in fact, uh, prior to the existence of nervous systems, uh, there was already not only life, but complex life, highly organized life, capable of, of feats of smarts and intelligence that are to be quite respected, I think. So uh, this is what I uh, uh, leave you with, the idea that feelings and consciousness are related, that feelings are in fact the beginning of the process of consciousness, uh, that feelings are not mere perceptions uh, of the state of the body, but rather interactive, complex perceptions due to the peculiar physiology of its neural components and to the overall physiological arrangement of 
uh, of, of, of the, uh, the, the relationship between body and nervous system. Um, and I think that I will stop for now so that we can uh, talk a little further uh, if you want to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antonio, for your wonderful talk. So important. And uh, now, to both of you, we'll start the question and answers time. And uh, we have already a few questions which I would like to make. Starting from a point that might be of interest for Eve, your study of neural networks in crucifixion with a countable number of few neurons has led vital foundation for current brain research projects. How much this established approach could represent the building of many models that cover the range of normal behavior parameters in humans? So from the simple to the complex, how you can uh, highlight these uh, crucial passages that was also mentioned by Antonio in his talk. So I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Um, I think when everyone, is, when everyone builds models, one has to decide what one is trying to reveal or explain or um, establish. So models always have to be built with some sort of sense of a puzzle or a question that one wants to understand. And I think um, the most useful models are ones which say, here is something I really don't understand. And now how can I build a model to help reveal that? Um, so I think whether you're doing it to try and understand some basic fundamental process in a human brain or in a crab brain, I think the essential features to say, here's a deep mystery, and now I can set up a, a model or a series of models or many models to try and answer that deep mystery. Does that help? Yes, I think it's, uh, it's important statements that uh, highlight how to go on on this direction. Uh, this is a question about resilience. Resilience is the ability of an individual to face and overcome a traumatic event or a period of difficulty. How is it possible that during the evolutionary period, severe and adverse events undermining the species' survival and our foundation of civilized living also, even more than one we are facing with now, have not produced devastating neural modification, but instead perhaps more resilient and protective molecular mechanisms? Well, I can tell you, I didn't, I took out a slide I probably should have shown you, which is, um, talks about resilience to climate change. Um, in 2012, the oceans never got cold during the winter. And following that, in the following spring and summer, our animals didn't crash. They went up to 36 degrees and were still functional. And what we didn't know at that point was whether the long period of very warm water during the winter had allowed there to be some long-term molecular adaptations or whether we had selected for a subpopulation that could deal with the adverse conditions or whether our animals went to Maine where the water was colder, and we were seeing animals that came north from, from Long Island. So that's a long way of saying that um, in a population, you're always going to have animals with different, um, different sets of underlying parameters. Some of them will be more resilient to a perturbation, and so conceivably you end up selecting for those animals, and those are the ones that live. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that you couldn't have animals with uh, a much more acute um, sort of change that then persists. I, I mean, I don't know if that answers the question. 
Thank you. <coughs> it's a difficult point. Uh, someone asked, uh, how much can stress, this can go to both of you, how much can stress affect the self-perception? How much can devastate a self-perception, the stress, uh, stressing condition? Perhaps it's better for Antonio, this question. Well, so the, 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 the idea for certain, I mean, this from clinical populations, one knows that, that uh, cases of acute stress and sustained stress uh, can alter uh, your, your evaluation of yourself uh, and can be, depending on the individual's personality and on the situation, can be devastating or not so much. Um, but um, sort of going towards the point, uh, one fundamental point that Eve has made is that we have these enormous systems for coping and for transformation. And if they are present, as she shows so well, at the very small level, imagine uh, how they are present in creatures with the complexity of uh, central nervous systems that we have. Uh, and then just one more thing is that in addition to the enormous variety uh, of, uh, of individuals that we have to begin with, uh, we also have all of the varieties of acculturation of those individuals. So how one copes with stress and how one is or not devastated by stress uh, depends uh, on, on your fundamental biological setup. Um, but also depends on what was done to that biological setup by the education that you received, by how the environment around you has treated you, and so forth. And also is related to age. Uh, you know, there, there, it's a different thing to have a devastating insult to your uh, to your stress systems uh, at age uh, sixty or to have it at age 12, or to have it at age 40, when you're presumably at the, at the, at the peak of your powers uh, and, uh, and quite uh, resilient physically and intellectually. So uh, it, it's, it, there's not one size that fits all. That's really the, the, the response. The variation is simply huge. And everything that we know today, whether it is from psychology uh, or from neuroscience, uh, at the macro level or from micro neuroscience is just telling us that the variation is huge and the, the ways out are huge as well. Yes, and I would like to pick up on that and say that the other thing that um, is clear is that there are many different kinds of stress and depending on what the stimulus that creates the stress, you may have more or less resilience to that. So for example, you could have an individual who is very resilient to one kind of stressor and much less resilient to another kind of stressor. And one of the things that I think is really going to be interesting is whether some individuals are more resilient to any kind of stressor and, and whether there's a series of orthogonal um, conditions where there's a trade-off between resilience to one kind of stress versus resilience to another kind of stress. And I think that's going to be a really, really interesting um, set of questions as we go forward to really try and understand that. And just one last thing along that, um, depending on the temporal, the timing at which the stressor comes, if it's a one-shot deal or repeated or long duration, you might expect very, very different biological sequelae. And I think, you know, the repeated, the repeated or the one shot, you know, you can have different kinds of adaptations depending on the dynamics of this, of the stressor. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the question was related to the self-perception. So we can think that stress couldn't affect self-perception because self-perception is part of the more solid, established way of functioning of our brain. So self-perception should remain the same. 
that's the point you or can change due to the stress, depending yeah. by the strength I would of the stress. Think that, I mean, Tony would be the person who really, I would say that anything that makes one feel um, weak in any way will potentially interact with one's sense of self and self-perception. So any kind of, any situation that makes you feel helpless is definitely going to erode your sense of self in some essential fashion. I mean, would yeah. you say the same thing? Yes. Oh, I would, yes. I would agree entirely. Yeah. And, and that's it's so, so interesting because that's, um, you know, there, there's no, there's no parity here. The positive side and the negative side are very different in terms of what they do to us. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to imagine um, that there can be an excess of pleasure and there can be an excess of goodness and there can be an excess of fine homeostatic positive adaptation. But the, 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 the negative results of that positive side are quite different from the negative results of, for example, pain, sustained pain or sustained uh, humiliation. You know, we, we, we see so, so, so well that in certain populations, um, sustained behavioral insults that of course translate into negative emotions and translate into negative physiology because it, it percolates down uh, into, into your very uh, biology, neural and non-neural, uh, the, the results are very asymmetric. So the, it's, not, um, it, it's, it's not really, uh, I totally agree with you, and I want to call attention to the fact that the positive side of feeling is not equal to the negative side. It's not in the middle. The, the positive is really very positive and the negative is really very negative. This is almost like quoting Tolstoy, who talked about the many, many kinds of unhappy families and the fact that there was one kind of happy families. So that there is more variation. Uh, you know, pleasure is pleasure, well-being is well-being, but think of all the, the ways in which we can be negatively affected you know, in all the names we give to the bad uh, uh, feeling states in relation to society and to the bad feeling states in relation to our own organism. There's a huge, there's a huge, huge variation in what can go wrong and in the consequences of what goes wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Which Daniel. actually put, puts a very, uh, Daniela, just one more point. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting how the, I, I'm very intrigued as a general a, a, a question, which is both a question in biology and, and a philosophical question as well, is uh, how we ended up uh, um, sort of staying with the positive and not with the negative. And why is it that we have maintained this regulation that favors uh, life and favors the good things that happen with life, uh, as opposed to the, the ones that favor the negative uh, regulation in the non homeostatic regulation. It's a very interesting, yes, very interesting this, this answer to the question in a, on one side also. It's very, very important. And uh, something which goes uh, in the same sense we might have feelings and uh, uh, perceptions which are not fully conscious. So we, our brain can be modulated and influenced by this kind of input, which are not really plenty, full of consciousness. So, but these also act on our neural mm -hmm. systems. So we have to take into account also this kind of level of consciousness, explaining behavior. Do you agree? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a point I'm that, uh, okay. Yeah. And going in the same direction, I have this question. Understanding the false beliefs, so the false beliefs, require, of course, a high level of conscious and high level of functioning. Need language, knowledge, culture. Children are able to understand them at the age of four or five years. Today, our society are facing with an enormous amount of fake news, which bombard our perceptions, able to influence our decision to build conscious reality deeply distorted and capable of negatively influencing society themselves. So we are 
you are seeing this kind of behavior, human behavior. So the fake news change our way of thinking. We believe in that. But which, which component of our brain? That's the question. If we consider this neural basis, where we can place such a weakness <laughs> or functioning, why we are not able to uh, consciously distinguish between something which is completely negative for us and for our similars. And how should we counteract it? Of course, I cite your belief that you write because it's important for knowledge and for increase our <laughs> capabilities, mental capabilities, to strengthen these neural circuits that otherwise will become weak and malfunctioning. Do you agree on that? That uh, we, we have to do oh, something on the brain. Like I would just like to say, I've, I, I'm sure that Tony has thought about this a lot, um, but I've been watching, obviously during, during this time, and I think the secret is repetition. And, you know, humans learn with repetition, and it appears that, you know, if you tell a lie often enough, large numbers of people will believe it, and that's exactly what happened during our past four years. You know, repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating lies makes them more plausible because that's how we learn. And I mean, maybe Tony has a different take on it, but I think some piece of it is just as simple as that. I think I would agree. I think we're, we're going through, uh, unfortunately, we're still going through that, that period. We're not out of the woods. Um, and, and I think that the answer to your question, Daniela, is, is really about, about education in general. And education has a tremendous amount that has to do with repetition. I think the, the only way of counteracting uh, uh, fake news and counteracting false beliefs is trying to demonstrate patiently that they are false, trying to demonstrate that they don't hold. Now, of course, you need to, you need to have a modicum of intelligence to be able to do that. Yeah. You need to be attentive. Uh, and on the side of the demonstrator, you need to be persuasive. And as Eve says, you probably need to repeat it. Um, but I think that uh, one of the, 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 the problem that we have gotten into in this recent years is I think in part related to something that to begin with is a plus for us and should be an enormous value, which is social networks. I think that the facility with which we have access to information, the, the, the fact that that is presented uh, rapidly uh, and, and with very little um, context, because that's part of the nature of communication, uh, of, of electronic communication these days. And the fact that it ends up being attractive because of the imagetic, pleasurable component, all of that go against the grain of this idea of solid thinking, going through the steps and trying to demonstrate that something is or is not uh, uh, real and trying to have, you know, it's not by chance that a lot of the fake news goes with the rejection of science. I guess with the rejection of science, because the, the, what we do in science is have ideas that are fundamentally hypotheses, and then go through a lot of trouble of analyzing those hypotheses, thinking through them, and trying to find some kind of model with which we can or not demonstrate the reality of our ideas. Now, all of this takes time and takes uh, the capacity of observation and, and some calm. It cannot be done at high speed, and it cannot be done by simply repeating uh, something as if it were true. Uh, and I think that the, 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 the reaction that people have, for example, uh, you know, in terms of climate change uh, or, uh, or the, the role of vaccines, which is something we're going to face in the next few months because there, there, there's an anti-vaccine movement that is 
quite powerful. Uh, all of these are uh, um, things that we need to cope with. And it's not a bad idea, as your question suggests, Daniela, that we analyze the circumstances in which this has become triumphant, in a way. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. We have other questions about uh, cultures. What role the feelings and emotions play in motivating the individual and collective actions to give origin to the cultures? Are there unconscious components against come out this mm. idea? Of... Well, yeah, there, there, there are, and, but, but it's very, very interesting. The, the, the relation between biology and culture uh, is a very strong one, and unfortunately, it has not been very much emphasized. Uh, I, I tried in a number of articles and in a book that I wrote, my last book, which is called The Strange Order of Things. And there, well, the, the fundamental idea in that book, uh, uh, in, in Italian, is uh, Un strano ordine delle cose. Um, the, the, the idea is that when you look, uh, I'm going to mention something I mentioned earlier. When you look at the behavior of say bacteria out in the field. And there are beautiful experiments that show what bacteria will do in, uh, in areas where they have good nourishment and areas where they don't. And one of the things that is so extraordinary is the way in which you can find in those creatures prior to having a nervous system, having a simple cell uh, with a lot of organelles and a very complex biochemical machinery, of course, what they do, they will, for example, if there is plenty of nourishment, they will scatter around and live as individuals. However, if there is not nourishment enough, or if, for example, the temperatures are falling, they will actually aggregate and try to gain strength in numbers. Um, some of them may actually, in terms of different amounts of um, nutrients in the environment may actually literally fool others into going or not going into that other region. So what, what we find is that in living organisms that are, of course, already regimented by homeostasis, there, there are degrees to which you can have these large social uh, behaviors, large scale social behaviors that are in fact the very grounding of societies and the very grounding of cultures. You know, a lot of the things we, we discuss in our cultures is how you organize yourselves socially and politically, how you define what is moral and not is moral, how you find ways to resolve the economic problems you're facing and so forth. But you know, you know, sort of close your eyes and think a little bit about the humble bacteria and they were already doing it in very simple ways, of course, but the scheme, the, the basic arrangement, or if you want, the motif is there already. Yeah. And I, that's why I'm, I'm so convinced that we have, in a way, as we ascended to nervous systems uh, and to all the complexities of behavior uh, and mind that came after it, uh, we, we, were all, we are sort of executing a large scale plan for living organisms. And I think we have to be the same way that we have learned in recent years to be respectful of creatures that are not human and respect their rights uh, and respect. We have to, to learn to respect the smarts of creatures that are very, very, very simple and about which we normally don't think because we don't even see them. We know that they're inside us. They can, they can do a lot of havoc, although the majority of them actually do lots of wonderful things for the maintenance of our organism. You cannot have a gut, gut, function, gut function without the, 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 the collaboration of bacteria. We cope each other. <laughs> and that's <laughs> very, very interesting, this idea of the biological rules that still uh, exist and still uh, we have to, like to consider. To if, please. Yeah, I'd like to add one more um, thought, and that is when I was being educated, there was a real burden on the student to remember a lot of what one had read because you 
had to be able to remember it, to reason and to think with it. And I remembered the papers I, I read and I remembered my data. Um, my students don't, are not in the habit of remembering to the same degree because they, they have it all on their phone. They have everything sort of, they, they have made the decision or they've been learned or they've learned that they can use their devices as memory tools. And I think that if you give up or you abrogate your own memory as a repository of experience, that may make you more hostage to the, the random things that come from those devices in a very interesting way. So, you know, I think, I think part and parcel of this is the way in which people learn to offload their memory to electronics. That's a beautiful point, Eve. I'm yeah. totally in agreement with you. You know, the, the, this business, you know, you cannot, you cannot behave correctly. Uh, nothing but both your, your creatures uh, as well as creatures like us. Um, you cannot behave correctly if you don't have memory. Memory is absolutely essential because if you don't have memory, you're going to, you're going to do wrong things. One of the ways in which you can reason or in which you can avoid wrong things is by remembering the bad things you did or the, the, the things you knew, you know already that you did and, and that control the operation. I think you're totally right. It's, it's quite, uh, I think both you and I have the experience of having graduate students around us, people that are much younger than we are, and you tell them something and they go to the phone and they, they, they sort of check it, they complete the thing. They're not asking their hippocampus to, to, to regurgitate the stuff that we have located in cortices and that should appear in our minds and, and be imperative. No, it's in there, it's in the device. And, and so uh, it, I think it's a, a very good possibility that we are, cer certainly your claim uh, or your suggestion that we are more vulnerable, for sure. I think you're absolutely right. But it could actually make us poorer reasoners because on the one hand, you have access to all the stuff that is on Wikipedia, but at the same time, you don't have access to the stuff that is inside you and is guiding you. So uh, I, I think that memory is a great point. Yeah. Thank you for all your comments, of course. Do you believe that brain function and activities in the future, even with the most sophisticated techniques, may be understood in their entirety? or there will always remain some aspects that by definition cannot be comprehended by our brain itself? That is a very supramodal <laughs> question. So our brain has some limits. I, 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 our brain couldn't understand the complexity. No, I, I don't think our brain is gonna understand everything, but I don't think we're anywhere close knowing where the limits are. I agree. I totally agree. And actually, when, when I was listening to you and you were, you were talking about the, 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 the variety of ion channels and the variety of the genetic control of the ion channels, um, you know, it, what we know today is still paltry compared to what we need to know which is one reason why I get very, very irritated when people say, well, you know, there's this problem of consciousness that you will never be able to solve. Uh, well, that, that, that's wrong. Uh, you know, we, we have, we, we're just beginning and I think there are many, many things that we are going to solve, which does not mean that we're going to know everything and solve everything. That I could agree with fundamentally, but let's be modest about what we know and let's be modest about what science has achieved so far and continue considering all these problems because the, the, the beauty of this is that every day you, you sort of open your, you know, I think that the idea that you have all of this non-neural intelligence is to me one of the most exciting things. And, and I, I grew up completely obsessed with the nervous system and with brains first as a neurologist and then as a neuroscientist. 
And yet I'm now equally amazed by what non-neural creatures can do. Uh, and, and I think that that's going to help illuminate what neurons can do as well. So I, I think there's one more thing that needs to be said, which is that there are tremendous advances being made today in figuring out how to display data so that we can visualize what's going on. And, you know, we don't think very well in nonlinear processes. You know, you start asking the humans to start reasoning about three nonlinear processes interacting, we're basically forced to write down models and then do simulations. Yeah. Um, except maybe a few mathematicians, but they're rare. Um, but I think one of the deep, deep, deep challenges that, and if this is happening, is that you need new ways of displaying data and organizing it so that our very smart, but also limited brains can understand it. And so I think when I say I don't know how far we're gonna go, I think depending on how well we do with figuring out how to display data will really determine how much we're going to be able to understand. Thank you. I agree completely. It's a very, very important point. So I think this is also an interesting issue. In your both fundamental works, seems to emerge that the factual knowledge necessary to reason and make decisions comes to the mind in the form of sensory perception visual images, sounds, sensory motor inputs, and emotions. How is it possible to demonstrate these characteristics of the thought, knowledge, and thus of consciousness? Be conscious of this event. What are the most relevant implications of these assertions? So still, it's a question on how can we measure and see and understand, I know, altogether, these characteristic of thought, so that we build up our thought based on feelings and emotion and so on. I think your talk was very <laughs> clear and uh, highlighting this, but the question is there. So we might uh, better explain. I, I, are you addressing the question to me? Yes, uh, yes uh, Antonio, yeah. but maybe both yeah. can raise from the more biological basis to the networks right you know it, it's a it's a it's an interesting question it's a, a very very complex question let me see how i, I could i could tackle it so uh, um what what is coming to my mind as you were asking the question is uh, one way in which we can enter these processes um of course it would be beautiful if we could do everything bottom up and do everything by the study of the nervous system in which we believe things are based mentally, and of course they are, um, but we cannot do it only through that avenue, not only because the complexity is huge. So if we were, <laughs> if you were asking me, okay, design a project in which you are studying uh, 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 feelings of pain, uh, beginning with what Eve Marder explained today about uh, connectomes of simple creatures. And of course, you, you, you'd say, forget it. You cannot do that because it, it would, it's, it's not that it is impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, technically, it, it might be possible, but it would be a very cumbersome way of going and you're very far away from where you want to be. Um, and one of the things that you need to admit is that after all of our developments in neuroscience and in biology, we still have to rely very importantly in something that was rampant in the 19th century uh, and in the beginning of the 20th century, which was introspection. Uh, and I like to say that what, what served William James and Sigmund Freud uh, um, um, so well, or for that matter, Proust or Virginia Woolf, uh, can serve me quite well too. Uh, so I am not at all uh, ashamed or embarrassed by using introspection. You have to use introspection. And it is marvelous that we have that possibility 
of looking inside our mind processes and uh, in using what we encounter to uh, organize our thoughts about the mind and organize the research we do on the mind. So whenever somebody tells me, well, uh, you know, we, if you use introspection, you're not being objective enough. I, I, all I have to say is this, come on, give me a break. I mean, you have, you're dealing with phenomena of the mind and objectivity in relation to phenomena of the mind is observing those phenomena and you can do it introspectively. Not only that, you can compare your introspection with the introspection of other people. And therefore you have a way of, of sort of reining in the, the potential errors of uh, um, that introspection might lead you into. I'm sorry, I was interrupted by a bad phone. Uh, so I, 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 need to, I need to say that it is, uh, um, uh, it is still possible for us uh, combining multiple introspections and combining introspection uh, uh, with the results of so-called objective analysis of biological structures. It is possible to uh, generate hypotheses, put those hypotheses to, to test, uh, and therefore produce advancements in science. Now, it, it should be clear also that the, the speed at which we can advance the science that relates to higher levels of behavior and mind is slower than the speed at which you can advance when you're dealing with the smaller scale mechanisms because the complexity is so much larger. But even so, thanks to things that you mentioned, for example, at the beginning, not only you have all of the new methods that Eve is using, yeah. but you have at our end something that is not quite comparable in, in fine detail, but is helpful, which is imaging, uh, for example, the kind that is produced by modern scanners. And, and, and that properly used uh, can can give quite a lot of information that can help decide on the validity of hypotheses. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Antonio. So, Thank you both. Eva, do you have a... You want no, to I would like to say that I think we all use introspection to some degree, but introspection is also can be quite wrong. And that is to say we have 70 million people who've introspected that we've had, you know, fraudulent mm -hmm. elections. So, um, but I think there's another path towards understanding that we haven't mentioned, which is beauty. So for example, when you see a particularly beautiful um, diaphyl of a neuron, you look at it and you say, there's something about that structure and its beauty that tells you things that you don't necessarily always truly understand what it's telling you but you recognize its validity or its truth partially because of its beauty, or we perceive it as being truthful because it's beautiful. And I think that's, that's another piece of how we use emotion or the perception of beauty as validation of truth in, a, in, in science in a, very, in a very interesting way. So for example, I just had a rotation student do a, a project in the lab and she generated some absolutely spectacularly beautiful images and because they were so beautiful i believe them and it's very interesting how belief comes with beauty in in in, in assessing biological systems um, and how one decides what's beautiful is, is actually should be something you should think about or you've already thought about yeah. thank you Eve. well so I, I, we, we are I, I, I thinking to i totally agree <laughs> Just one quick, one quick uh, response. Uh, no, I think that, that, that beauty uh, can, to a certain degree, be an arbiter. Uh, and it, of course, it can mislead you the same way introspection can mislead you. Uh, although, by the way, I, I don't think the introspection that is misleading us in the case of the, the, the 70 million you mentioned uh, is the, the introspection that you need to do in our science, but nonetheless, you know, there are many ways of being misled. However, the, 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 the beauty uh, gives you that sense of confidence because it 
is, is triggered by a recognition of harmony, a recognition of fittingness in the puzzle. If the, if the, the pieces of the puzzle fit nicely, you get a happiness, you get a, a positive response that comes from discovering the harmony, discovering the closure in, in the design. And I totally agree with you. I think it can be, uh, if it is well-trained, uh, if it is well-trained recognition of beauty, uh, it, 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 it's wonderful. And, and I think it can help you. And it's one, one other way in which uh, psychological mechanisms can help uh, this uh, sort of crazy job of science that we try to do with all our methodologies. Yes. I think Danielle is getting yes. better. <laughs> our yeah. brain is consonant also. The brain loves rules and not uh, dissonant things. And uh, this is true for a lot of uh, sensory motor input and uh, cognition. I think the time passed through and uh, we have to stop here uh, this very interesting uh, session. And uh, I'm very happy that you both were here with us and for the long discussion that we have and the time we have for that. And uh, so I thank you again. And uh, I have to remember everybody that tomorrow we will have another session on the languages of human consciousness. The moderator will be Jubi Nabutalebi. And the speakers will be Andrea Moro with the impossible languages, infinity as the fingerprints of the human mind, and Stanislas de Han with a talk with the title Human Singularity, which aspects of consciousness are shared with other primates and which are unique to humans. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all the audience. And uh, I think now we have to close the session. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.